put your phone number on it, give you a call, and we'll get acquainted. If you don't want me to call you, put someone else's phone number on <laughs> uh, um, A part of our worship today will be, as always, the Lord's Supper. And it's our tradition that everybody in this room is invited to participate, if you choose. Children typically begin to commune about second grade, although some children commune even younger. But just so you kind of are aware of that. Um, we're singing a couple of, we're singing some old hymns today. And I hope you like it. It's sort of going back to old times for me to sing some of these hymns. Maybe that's enough. We have a saying here. Wherever you are on your faith, your life's journey, you are welcome in this place this morning. Uh, let us stand and join in singing our opening hymn. Uh, uh, what's it called? It's called, uh, it's called, In the Cross of Christ I Are. And we'll pause just a second after you stand. If the organ starts, we'll begin to sing.
from the scriptures. It's Mark chapter 8. This was last week's. Chapter 8, starting at verse 27. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. And then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. The grace Christ. You may be seated, and I invite young people forward for us. Good morning. I see you. I see Kate. And I see Savannah. So we got only three people. Well, here's my question for today. Has anybody ever called you? Has anybody ever called you the wrong name? Peyton says yes. Uh, maybe some I mean my wife has a sister named Carol. And she has a daughter named Greta. And sometimes she calls her sister the name of her daughter. And sometimes she calls her daughter the name of her sister. And I'll bet you Peyton sometimes your mom says, Presley, I mean, I mean, Peyton. And she gets it confused this first. And your mom does that sometimes she gets the wrong name. You know what I mean? And and sometimes, you guys know Max and Nate, who are identical twins. Could you tell them apart? Not very good. These two people, Savannah, are two little boys. They look exactly the same. And when I see them, I say, Max or Nate, because I don't know which one it is. And one time, when I was in a grocery store, a little girl came up to me when I was standing here looking at something, and took hold of my leg like this. And I looked out for her room. And then she looked up and saw me. And she started to cry. She thought I was her father. But I was a stranger. Sometimes we get confused at who someone is. So Jesus is walking along with his disciples. They're walking along the path. And he asked them this question. Who do people say that I am? It's a good question. He'd been around for a while now. He had been teaching and healing and arguing with the religious leaders. And he's wondering what people are beginning to say about this. Some say, you're like John the Baptist preaching repentance. Some say you're Elijah, you do wonderful things. Some say one of the prophets, you preach and teach. And then Jesus says, who do you 
see that I am. Do you know me? And Peter, he's the one who put his hand up. He said, you are the Messiah. And he got it right. Except he didn't quite know what that meant. Because that's when Jesus starts telling people he's going to go to Jerusalem and suffer and die on the cross. And Peter doesn't let them. No way. I will not let them do that to you. And Jesus tells Peter, get behind me. You are not of God's side, but people. Sometimes, it's interesting that someone gets to know your name. And then they get to know who you are. We know who we are. You're Luke. And you're Savannah. And I'm Pastor Earth. And you're Peyton. And we're followers of Jesus. That's who we are. But anyhow, it's good to see you. I'm glad you're up there. Have a good week. Have a good week. Does it happen all at once, like being wound up? Yes, or does it happen bit by bit? It doesn't happen all at once, said the skin horse. You become. It takes a long time. That's why it doesn't happen to people who break easily, or have sharp edges, or who have to be careful. Generally, by the time you are real, most of your hair has been loved off, and your eyes drop out, and you get loose in the joints and very shabby. But these things don't matter at all, because once you are real, you can't be ugly. Except for people who don't understand. 
the rampant side. He longed to become real, to know what it felt like. And the idea of growing shabby and losing his eyes and his whiskers was rather sad. He wished that he'd become real without those uncomfortable things happening to him. Was it only in losing yourself that you could become real? It's a bit like what Jesus says in our gospel lesson. If any want to be my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. But those who lose their life, for my sake, for the sake of the gospel, will save it. It leads to this timidity the great missionary, Paul, seems to be convinced that his life is coming to its close. And so he writes this letter to Timothy, the young man. It's all about equipping Timothy, advising him, teaching him, encouraging him. Timothy is going to take over the ministry. Paul writes the letter for Timothy, but at the same time, it serves as a, a window a little glimpse inside of Paul into the thinking of the great apostle. He is writing from prison. <coughs> the way he writes it is only sound that roll. He begins, as for me, I am already being poured out as a libation, and the time of my departure has come. Poured out as a libation. That is an offering, a drink offering of wine or olive oil, a drink offering to God. It's as though he sees his life as being a bottle of wine. And the bottle is almost empty. He is almost done. His life has been poured out as though it were an offering. It's nearing the end. There are only a few drops left. The work which God had called him to do is ending. It is time for his exodus, his departure. But facing death, still the suffering, the mercy, all around him, I sense something here that I want to understand in Paul. What is it? It is it, what I sense is something in Paul that I want. A satisfaction. Even a profound gratitude that though his life has been far short of easy and is now soon over, he has hung on to the end, and I sense this satisfaction in him. Thank you for his life and how it has gone. He's only a few drops left of being empty. But it's been poured out for something important, for the mission of God. It is this awareness that I want at the end of my life. He writes, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness. I wonder if this text doesn't make us think a bit harder about our basic premises of life and what makes a good one and what Christ calls us to. For oftentimes, I get caught up in some notion that my life is mine. To spend it in whatever way I want. And what I want is pleasure and easiness. And I want fun. And what I don't want is something that is hard or demands sacrifice or causes suffering. I want my life for me and I want my life easy. It's a modern view. How I make my decisions, how I spend my time, what the drops in this old wine bottle get poured out on. And sometimes, I don't want to pour that out on anything. I want to keep that for myself.
himself. I want to come to the end with the bottle still full. Keep them forever. Don't give them for anything. It's not what Paul has done. Satisfy their empty, but satisfy their at the end. When I'm in my keep my life for me mode, I look to God to do just more of the same, but from his holy place. I need a God who will be like a, a narcotic that will keep my life easy. My challenge is small, my problems few, and surround me with a nice indulgent church that will pat my head and say what a good guy I am and remind me not to take things too seriously. I mean, does anyone need hard challenges in their life that will demand from them that they be poured out? And yet, how this text sets such a doctrine, this modern view, on its head. Paul Scott has called him forth numerous times into trying situations demanding personal sacrifice, asking him to pour himself out as though he were an offering. And nowhere in this letter does he even hint to young Timothy that his life of faith is going to be easy. He knows that any life committed to following Jesus Christ for sure is going to be a life of a, with its share of consternation and difficulty. Who wants all that? Deny yourself and take up your cross. But then I look at Paul at the end. And this place he has come to. I can feel it. This peace he seems to know. Even this joy. And lo and behold, I find myself envying him. And his fulfillment. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. The call to us is the same. Nobody knows God's timeline. But if you've got a lot of living yet to do, or maybe just a few more days, if you seemingly have a a lot of years ahead of you, or maybe obviously not so many anymore, but think of yourself as a bottle of wine. Many, many think, many struggle, many try. How do I keep it for myself? But with the ticking of the clock, they will become empty. They who seek to keep their life well. You can't keep it. It's a waste of who you are. But using it on a drink off, an oblation to something, make your life an offering to God. Pour it out for something worth pouring it out for. Jesus told us that he who seeks to keep his life will lose it. He finishes the sentence. She who gives her life for the sake of the gospel will find it. You may be warm and shabby when you come to the end of those days. Half your hair may be lost through those years. You may have joints that hurt and a heart that's been wounded much but if you have come to this loss by giving your life away, perhaps we will know what the skin horse was talking about. How to become real. A real human being that God and his son called to be. He who loses his life for me for the sake of the gospel
we're going to sing an old hymn, uh, an old gospel hymn from our African American Lutheran hymnal. So I invite you to stand and we'll sing all the music.
Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. And after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup is a new covenant sealed with my blood, poured out for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The table is ready in all our welcome. This morning we will be coming up to kneel or stand at the railing. If the steps are difficult for you, you can sit in the front pew and we will bring communion to you. You may be seated and we say, Lamb of God.
stand. Oh God, in this holy meal, you have embraced us and gathered us into your arms of compassion and protection. Release us now to go on our way in these 40 days, ready to see our work as prayer, ready to fast from complacency, and ready to share with those in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. May Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. I close the hymn on the old rugged cross.
Sunday morning at 9 o'clock, there is the series, and this morning was on Islam, and next week it's our introduction to the Old Testament. The second Tuesday night of this week, we have community cafe. You check the board to see if we got enough people signed up. I should have looked before I came out. I don't know. But we don't do a Thursday. The Radio River Community College students, I think, are taking So we have just Tuesday. Then on Wednesday, in this very room, we host the Brown Robin Lenten series. We're preaching on commandments for living. The one that's going to be here is honor your father and mother. And I'm, I have no idea what I'm going to do. i got to preach about that. I don't know what I'm going to say. I've never preached about honor your father and mother. So pray for me tonight and tomorrow. <laughs> It's, a, it, it's, a, it's such an important commandment. In the first one of the second table, because before thou shalt not kill. What is it about moms and dads? Anyhow, I gotta think about it. And, and that's on, on uh, Wednesday. And before that, we have soup downstairs. I think it's all been ready down here, but we might need more soup. There's also a side of sheet for soup, or bread, or crackers. Because that's what we serve to the community that when they come. And people to help serve. If you would care to bring some soup, sign up, bring some soup. We start at 6 o'clock or some bread and stick around and help put it together and serve. And come for worship. And then the following week, come again. We go to crazy night. On, uh, we shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Anyway, you see the idea of what we're doing. You can see some, uh, some stuff on the following page about some money projects and things we're trying to do. And the little announcement that we're a bit behind so far for this year. I'll just bring it to your attention. I hope you have a great week. Go in peace and serve the